This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, we move on now to the topic of agency. Um, just a, a quick word or two about agency. In the days before F4 was um, 100% multiple choice, when it was in the days where there were 10 questions of 10 marks each and there were written questions where you had to write many essays, agency was a very rare visitor to F4. That's not an uh, unusual to find F4 exams that didn't have an agency question. There was often a partnership question and there was often there for a question from this joint area agency and partnership. But more often than not, it was a question on partnership. So agency didn't play such a major role in F4. But of course, now we have this 100% MCQ type exam, then agency is more likely to crop up. However, I would be very surprised to find more than, say, two questions. I can imagine that there will always be one, but I have pretty safe ground to think there's not likely going to be more than two questions in the F4 exam in the current formats that it is. That doesn't mean to say we can ignore it, of course, but it does mean that it's of, can I say, dare I say, it's of lesser importance than some of the stuff that we've already been looking at. So here we are, we're going to look uh, in this lecture, it's, hopefully it's not going to be a long lecture, but hopefully we're going to be looking at the creation of uh, agencies, that's where we're going to start, uh, and then we're going to be looking at the authority of agents and the different types of authority and how that authority is derived. And then towards the end we're looking very quickly at the termination of the agency relationship, and then finally again, very briefly, the potential liability of agents. So that's where we're going. And we're going to start then, first of all, with the creation, agency creation. And an agent, when I was a, a youth, a number of years ago now, when I was a youth, it was not an uncommon um, job description for people to call themselves agents or representatives or and that used to be abbreviated to reps and a person will be a rep for a sweet company for for Cadbury's for instance and they would drive around the country and they would uh, negotiate sales of the employer's products Cadbury's chocolates for instance they would drive around from sweet shop to sweet shop and negotiate and enter into transactions on behalf of Cadbury's so an agent as a person that is employed by another, the principal, in order to negotiate, arrange to enter into contracts on behalf of that principal. And that's the role that these people uh, assume. So here we are in the, the notes, an agency relationship it exists between a principal and an agent in which the role of the agent is to bring the principal into contractual positions with third parties. Now, these notes do go on and I suppose they assume that the principal is a company and that the agent is a director. It doesn't have to be that. A partner, for instance, is an agent of the firm and the other partners. A director is the agent of the company of which he is a director. But that doesn't have to be the case. It's not narrowed down to that at all. All sorts of people can be agents of others. Uh, I remember when I was buying um, a home back in the 1980s, the late 80s, uh, I had some intense things going on in my life just at the time that I was wanting to, to finalise the purchase of this house. So I appointed my solicitor uh, to be my agent and I gave him full authority. I, I, I appointed him so that he could act as though he were me without having to keep coming back to me asking questions. So it's actually my solicitor that bought my, my house that I'm talking about in the late 1980s. Um, I just gave him full authority and that was called the power of attorney. And power of attorney has to be in writing. But it's not always the case 
that um, an agency relationship has to be in writing. So here we go. It may be established in a number of ways. It may be established by agreement, either by express agreement or by implied agreement. There's actually two ways of, of agreeing something. Express agreement is where it's all formal, it's all written down and signed and documented and so on. But implied agreement doesn't require that, doesn't require that formality. So it's usually in writing. The person will appoint an agent typically with specific restricted authority with our sweet shop agents, our sweet shop representatives, our sweet shop Cadbury's representatives. They have the authority specifically to negotiate the sale of Cadbury products. They didn't have the authority to go and buy new cars, a new fleet of cars for the Cadbury company. So if you are, when you appoint an agent, it would not be unusual to appoint them in writing with specific restricted authority. But it doesn't have to be. As I've said, my solicitor and, and the purchase of my house and the back end of the 1980s, uh, if the agent has unrestricted power to act on behalf of the principal, uh, then this is a power of attorney. It must be in writing. But I signed over entirely. He could have done anything that he thought was good or Actually, he could have done anything at all, whether he thought it was good for me or not. He had unlimited power because I had appointed him as my attorney, a power of attorney. By agreement implied, as a result of the conduct of two parties, the courts, if it ever came to court, the court may look and, and say, well, you have acted as though you were a principal and this other person has acted as though they are your agent. So... We're going to assume that an agency relationship does exist. So you have to be very careful here as to what you allow other people to do, because if they act as though they are your agent with authority and you don't do anything to stop them when you find out what they're doing, then it could be that the court will say, yes, this person has the implied authority to enter into contracts on your behalf because you allowed it to happen. By ratification, ratification is interesting. Ratification is, is after the fact. Where a person appears to act as your agent and has no authority to do so, and then subsequently a third party comes knocking on your door and says, I've entered into this contract with you through your, your agent. Whoa, 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 what agent? I don't have an agent. Oh, well, this person said that they were your agent. Well, what's the details of this contract that they've entered into apparently on my behalf? What are the details? Oh, it's this, 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 and this. And I'm thinking about it as well. Actually, that's not a bad deal. Yeah, okay. Yes, I, I shall accept that this person did have authority. I shall ratify their actions. And therefore, I shall assume the responsibilities of this contract. If it's a contract for me to sell goods, then I shall sell the goods because it's not a bad deal that this person has entered into, apparently on my behalf. So ratification is the creation of an agency relationship after the person has been acting as an agent without authority. So an unauthorized person acts in a way that suggests that they're an agent. The person on whose behalf they claim to be acting may adopt or ratify, therefore, the contract. It's not possible if I didn't exist. So where a person acts as though they are an agent on behalf of a proposed company, the company is in the process of being created, and a person says, I want to order a quantity of goods on behalf of this proposed new company uh, then when the company is created and it gets its certificate of incorporation it turns around and says can we ratify this contract and the answer is no they can't because you can't have a person acting as an agent on behalf of a non-existent person and a company that is only in the process of creation doesn't exist it's like taking an action on behalf of uh, your child that is scheduled to be born in the year 2022. And it's 
not yet happened. It's not even in embryo condition. You can't enter into a contract on behalf of a non-existent person. So for ratification to apply, the inverted commas principle must have existed at the time that this purported agent entered into a contract on your behalf. Ratification applies to the entire contract and must be notified to the third party who must have known that the agent was acting as an agent even though that agent didn't have any proper authority. A person pretends that they're acting as an agent the third party knows that this person is acting as an agent and doesn't know that it's only a pretend, uh, then ratification can take place. Next one is by estoppel. If, if you allow someone to act on your behalf without any authority, but you know that this is what they're doing, you're a company. A senior person, not a director, a senior person in the company has been acting on the company's behalf without authority, but you've allowed it to go on because the deals that have been made have been reasonable deals. When he makes a bad deal, the entity can't turn around, the company can't turn around and say, this person had no authority. You're stopped from denying. So the creation of the agency relationship may be by estoppel. Even though they are not officially an agent, nevertheless, you are prevented, you are estopped from denying that they are an agent. So where the principle holds out to third parties that somebody is their agent, then they can't deny later that he is their agent. They can't deny that. By necessity, this is an interesting one, they're all interesting, aren't they? But by necessity, this is where circumstances dictate that someone has to take action, even though they have no authority to take that action. They take action because there would be, say, substantial loss to one other person. So there was a, an English law case about the transshipment of corn from the United States back to the UK and the corn in the hold of the ship and the, the belly of the ship it started to go off so the captain of the ship took it into his head that if he didn't do something about this then by the time they arrived back in Liverpool the whole shipment would be worthless so he went into the Azores, he sailed into the Azores. We're talking way before telephones. We're talking about the middle of the 19th century. So he turned into the Azores and sold the corn on the, the dockyard of the Azores port that he had put, sailed into. And then he came back to Liverpool and the owner of the corn said, where's my corn? And the captain said, well, it was going off, so I, I turned into the Azores and I sold it. We, he had no authority. But it was accepted he did have authority. He had the authority, he was an agent of necessity. He had to do something, otherwise it would have caused major financial loss. Another example was the, the delivery of a horse. I love this one. The delivery of a horse to a, a railway station. Again, we're talking in the times before mobile phones, before telephones. And the horse was delivered, it was unloaded by the, the guard on the railway train, it was unloaded by the, the uh, railway employee and fastened up to the uh, post on the platform of this village station. But there's nobody there to meet it. There's no, nobody to take the horse and, and, and ride it away. So the railway employee who worked at the station took it into his head that he would take this horse down to the local, the word is livery, to the local livery stables, which is a, a place where people can leave their horses and have them looked after. He took this horse down to the livery stables to be looked after. And three days later, somebody turned up and said, where's my horse? Well, if it had been left on the railway platform, apart from the mess that he would have made, it would have probably died of thirst or hunger or, or lack of care. So 
the employee of the railway company said, I've taken it to the local livery station. And the owner of the horse said, well, you had no right. What, what authority did you have to incur me in, in this obligation, this new debt? He said, well, I thought it was a sensible thing to do. And he went to court because the owner didn't want to have to pay the livery fees. And the defence was, well, I was an agent of necessity. And the court agreed. It, it had something had to be done in order to look after the horse. And the sensible thing was to take it to the livery station. Did the railway employee have authority? Well, yes, he did. He was an agent of necessity. We'll move on now to authority. <coughs> the authority of an agent may be expressed, it may be implied, or it may be apparent. The first one's very easy, isn't it? Express authority is where you say, you have the authority to act on my behalf and sell Cadbury sweets to sweet shops all over the country. So express authority is straightforward. It's where the principal expressly authorises the agent in relation to specific contract. It may be written or it may be oral. Always safer to be in writing. There's a, an ironic expression in English that says an oral contract is not worth the paper that it's written on. Well, of course, an oral contract isn't written on any paper and, and therefore it's worthless. So very difficult to establish the facts of an oral contract. So express appointment, it will probably be written, but it may be an oral appointment. Where an agent acts beyond the limits of this authority, the agent will be liable for breach of warranty. But how do you establish this if it's an oral contract? That's the difficulty, isn't it? But anyway, if it's a written contract and we can establish the limits of this agent's authority, if he goes beyond there, if he acts, and there's a, a Latin expression, I know you, many students love Latin, if he acts ultra vires or ultra vires, beyond the powers, beyond the limit of his authority, where the agent acts beyond this limit, they will be liable for breach of warranty. Not only to the principal, because the principal has said, this is the limit of your authority, don't you dare go beyond that limit. And if they do, they will be liable to the principal. But they may be liable also to the third party that is now suffering as a result of this excessive authority, excessive power used by the agent. Implied authority, it arises where the agent acts in accordance with what's normal in the, in the circumstances. There's a case about um, an English law case uh, about um, the manager of a, uh, a drinking establishment, a public house, a pub. And the owner of the pub had appointed a manager with the strict instruction that the manager had got the power to do anything but not he had no power, he restricted power. He must not buy cigarettes or tobacco or tobacco products or any product related to smoking because the owner was heavily anti-smoking. And the bar manager did. He went and bought a, um, a display cabinet of some cigars. And then the owner found out and, and refused to pay. He said, no, 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 he's beyond his authority. But the cigar supplier said, well, how could I know that? This normal, that a bar manager has the implied authority to buy stuff that is normal to be sold behind bars. Beer, spirits, wines, tobacco products. And so it's implied authority that the bar manager used to buy these cigars. And therefore the, the bar owner was responsible and had to pay for those cigars, even though he had specifically restricted the bar manager not to buy that stuff. Of course, he's then got a claim against the bar manager, but what chance have you got there? Yes, you'd win in court. It's going to be an expensive operation to go to court. And it could very well be the case that the bar manager says, well, I can't afford. Can I pay at the rate of 10 pence per week for the next 832 years? So it's unlikely that you would pursue your claim against your bar manager. So, implied authority, where an agent acts and it comes with what's normal, 
So if an agent acting as a purchasing officer of an entity <coughs> may be seen to have the implied authority to enter into purchasing contracts. And in that case, the company, the entity, will be liable to a third party, but they'll have a claim against the agent because the agent has exceeded his authority. But are you likely to pursue that claim against the agent? Probably not. But you do have the right to. Legally, you have the right to take the agent to court and seek compensation. Apparent authority of the third one, sometimes called ostensible authority, may be greater than actual authority. And apparent and ostensible authority arises where the entity allows the agent to act as though they have <coughs> excuse me. As though they have authority, even though they don't. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Where a third party contracts with this agent, and they're not aware of any restriction on the agent's powers, the company, the entity, is going to be liable to an innocent third party. I'm going to sneeze again. <coughs> 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 I might do another one. Bear with me. This apparent or ostensible authority is not limited to what is normal. Remember, the implied is limited to what is normal. The apparent or ostensible authority is not limited to this normality. It could be much wider. And if these five bullet points, <coughs> these five bullet points apply, then it will be much wider. The entity itself, not just the director. Remember, I said. The notes talk about entities and directors. It doesn't have to be. But the company itself, and not just the director, represents the agent as having wider powers. This should be a question of fact, not a question of law. It must be made direct to the third party, and not therefore to someone else. The third party must show that they've relied upon it, and that they have acted upon that misrepresentation. And if we can get through all of that, if we can satisfy those five bullet points, then it's likely that the court will say, oh, this person does have apparent or ostensible authority. Termination, very, very quickly, termination of the agency relationship, either terminated by agreement, so we say to our chocolate salesperson, our chocolate representative, you're finished, you're through, uh, we no longer need you, you're redundant, uh, we don't want your services as an agent anymore, thank you very much, and here's a, uh, a couple of hundred pounds to say thank you, and good luck in the future. So, termination by agreement. Oh, the agent may say, I no longer want to sell your goods. Or, by operation of law. <clears throat> and by operation of law, for instance, it would be a, a requirement that a travelling salesperson, a travelling representative, a travelling agent should have a driving licence and should be <clears throat> allowed to drive. And it, it could be uh, a precondition of employment as an agent that they have a clean driving licence. That being so, when they do get fined and stopped or disqualified from driving, then I suppose that by agreement it will be written within the contract that if you lose your licence, that you finished. Automatically terminated by, well, death. <coughs> death is the automatic termination of, of anything, really, isn't it? Um, so death either of the principal or of the agent. Um, insanity of either the principal or the agent. Difficult to prove. How do you prove someone's insane? How do you prove that? You can get them certified, I suppose, or you could take them to court and the court would say, are you insane? And the agent says, no, in which case the court will probably think you are. So insanity of either the agent or the principal. Or bankruptcy of the principal would, would bring about the end of the, uh, the agency relationship because the principal can no longer pay for the agent's services. So that would be automatic. You can't be a principal and bankrupt. You can't be a partner 
and bankrupt. You can't be a director of a company and bankrupt. So bankruptcy of the principal brings about the end of the agency relationship. And just finally, liability of the agent, and I'm sorry to disappoint you because I didn't sneeze that third time, did I? But liability of the agent, <clears throat> so long as the agent acts within the limits of their authority, they incur no liability. So an agent acting within that limitation, within the restrictions that have been imposed on him, uh, then he incurs no liability. And he, but he can't equally, he can't enforce the contract. He can't make this shop owner go ahead and buy the Cadbury's sweets. And if Cadbury choose not to pursue the contract that the agent has entered into, the agent has no right, he can't enforce uh, that contract. But an agent may be held personally liable where they do enter into a contract without disclosing the existence. The, the concept of the undisclosed principle. So it looks like they're acting on their own behalf because they don't say that they're acting as an agent. And in that case, if the third party believes that they're acting on their own behalf, uh, then the agent will be liable. The agent acts on his own behalf even though claiming to act on behalf of a principle. An agent saying, I'm acting on behalf of a principle, so the concept of the disclosed principle. I'm acting on behalf of, of uh, my employer, but actually the, the contract that they enter into, they know is to be taken for their own use. They, they're going to use it for themselves. The benefit of the goods that they're acquiring is going to be kept private and, and put into their own uh, use. In that case, Again, <coughs> the agent will be liable. And no, normal trade customers, if, if normal trade customers establish that an agent should be liable in certain circumstances, then the court will quite happily go along with what has been developed over a number of years as usual or normal trade custom. And that's it for agency. I said at the start, it's not likely to feature heavily in any future F for exam, uh, but they're a bit interesting. It's, it's um, an interesting little topic, but not one to get over excited about.